Namaste. Human knowledge and intelligence are limited. For example, there is no way to know when a, a given fruit will fall from a particular tree. Yes, we can say, taking the whole orchard as a sample, that within a certain amount of time, X percent of the apples will fall. And even that is just an estimate, and it could be off. There's no way to say when a particular apple will fall. Just like there's no way to know when a particular atom, radioactive elements, will decay. And there's no way to know when a particular electron will change its energy state and emit a photon, let's say. In other words, our knowledge is always approximate. It's always of the aggregate, the average. It's never accurate to the individual. This also applies to spiritual knowledge. If someone tries to tell you, if you do such and such a spiritual uh, practice, then this will be the result. They're bluffing. There is no such exact knowledge. All we can say that is, in aggregate, over many, many, many examples and many years of practicing, in general, this particular spiritual practice will give such and such a result. And even then, it's only an estimate. It can never be a definite prediction. Anybody who says otherwise is simply bluffing. <laughs> Maybe they have your best interest at heart. Maybe they're trying to enthuse you to practice some spiritual work of some kind and hope that you'll get a, a good result. But there's no way to tell, really. No way to know exactly. But we can say, you know, in general, if you practice a mantra, you will get a good result. In general. Now, some people may practice the mantra offensively and get a bad result. See? Same goes for any kind of worship, any kind of study, any kind of puja or any kind of spiritual practice whatsoever. Some people have gone psychotic by practicing meditation. Anapanasati, meditation on the breath. Nowadays, you know, with the climate of, uh, of litigation that exists, especially in the West, before you can go to you know, one of these meditation retreats, they have to screen you for possible psychosis <laughs> so they don't get sued. <laughs> so how do we know then? Well, you just have to try it and find out. I mean, really, this is, I'm being completely honest here. There's no other way to know. You have to try it. I find that my intuition is a reliable guide. My heart is a reliable guide. If I try something and it feels good, if it seems to lead in a good direction, then I'll go with it. I'll do it some more. I'll do it until I stop feeling good about it. And then I'll stop and I'll reconsider. So this is where most traditional spiritualists go wrong. This is where most scriptures depart from reality. This is where most traditional spiritual teachers 
go off. They try to assert that they have exact knowledge, that their knowledge is always repeatable and works for anybody and everybody. It's just not true, folks. So you have to exercise a certain amount of caveat emptor, huh? Let the buyer beware. Check it out for yourself. Don't believe all claims, even in scriptures. Scriptures especially, and the teachers who claim to represent them, tend to focus too narrowly on one point of view alone and then see everything from that point of view as if it's the absolute truth that applies to everyone always. But as we have pointed out on this channel in earlier videos, what you see depends on how you look, your point of view, where you are looking from, the state of consciousness that you're in when you look. So something that is true for someone, let's say, in the stage of Dvaitavada, duality, is not true at all for someone in Vivartavada, the stage of meditation. And it's completely untrue for someone in the highest state of Turiya consciousness, Ajatavada. So we have to exercise discrimination even regarding the truths in the scriptures. Because a particular spiritual method may be appropriate for a given person at a particular time and stage in their spiritual development, and it may be completely inappropriate for another person or even the same person at a different time, at a different stage of development. Now, I'm sorry if this makes you feel uncertain or insecure. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. In general, all spiritual advice is good advice. The problem is when our minds get involved in the process and we try to extrapolate on a linear basis from what we think we know that almost always fails. For one thing, spiritual life is a lot more complicated. Consciousness is a lot more sophisticated. And then again, we're also dealing with entities like Shiva and Shakti, who like to have fun. And sometimes they'll put you on the spot. They'll test you. Sometimes they'll trick you just to see what you'll do. <laughs> and sometimes they'll bless you out of all proportion to your actual efforts or uh, services offered. It's impossible to tell. They are conscious entities, independent. They can do whatever they want and they have infinite power within the world. So there's no telling, you know. I like to tell the story of my first big enlightenment experience in 1984. I had been at Rancho Rajneesh up in Oregon for like six months. And I had nothing to do there except meditate. And I did a lot of meditation. And so then when I left, or more precisely, got kicked out because <laughs> the other so-called sannyasins became envious, I came back to my apartment in Portland and I did exactly nothing. I sat. I did just total Zen meditation. No method no schedule, no um, particular goal in mind. I just sat and watched what was going on inside. And it was fascinating. 
it was highly interesting. That couldn't happen today. But then it was exactly the right medicine. At that time, all kinds of things happened spontaneously. Chakras opening, Kundalini rising, uh, getting Shakti pot directly from Shakti. You know, all these wonderful things happened. But what did I do? Nothing. I just sat. And then there have been other times when I was striving so earnestly, trying this and that and the other thing, and nothing happened. At least, apparently, nothing happened. Now, there is an interpretation that goes something like this. When you're doing some spiritual process and nothing seems to be happening, actually, something is happening, but it's just not within your range of vision. It's too subtle or it involves karma from a previous life and or something that you don't have access to. Um, okay, that's a nice theory. <laughs> but practically speaking, how does it help us to chart our course through the maze of different spiritual teachings and practices? This is a very difficult question. I have to say, for me, it's always been about experience. It's always been about experimentation and listening to my intuition, listening to my heart. And that when something is no longer fun, when it's no longer interesting, when it becomes a routine, a grind, a duty, when I have to force myself to do it, it's probably time to move on. Drop it and look for something better, something that works now for you as you are in the moment. See, like just the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of music and I'm getting so much juice from it. Putting the five syllable mantra, Om Namo Shivaya, into musical settings. Does that mean I should like, uh, you know, start up a, a group to do this or something? like? No, no, because just because it works for me now in this particular place and time, that doesn't mean that and I can scale it, huh? Like the startup people are so naive. They think if I find a particular product that works, you know, for me or for some small group of people, I can scale it unlimitedly and it'll work for everybody. But no, that, that's not true. That's why over 90% of startups fail. They try to grow. They take some venture capital. And now they're under the gun. They have to produce results. And so they force it. Forced growth is almost never stable. At some point, it's going to stop and it's going to crash. Look at what's happening to Facebook. Look at what's happening to every big company that got way up on the growth curve. They didn't know how to shift from growth mentality to sustainable type of operation, and so they crash, trying to push growth beyond its limits. And the same is true of spiritual life. I got a letter, an email, the other day from a lady who had encountered my teachings way back 10, 12 years ago. And at that time, we were doing a lot of Vishnu Sahasrana. Well, I still chant Vishnu Sahasrana. <laughs> it's not that I don't believe in it anymore. Vishnu Sahasrana is a wonderful practice. And anyway, she, among all the students that I'm aware of, took me seriously and has been chanting Vishnu or listening to Vishnu Sahasrana all this time. 
and gotten great benefits from it. So it worked for me. It worked for her. Does that mean it'll work for you? Who knows? <laughs> Try it and see. And keep trying. And that's how you'll find the spiritual path that's right for you. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.